we can switch directly to the first technical topic. So what we want to look into is what is the geometry of the image pair. So it means we are look now looking not into a single image, we're looking to pairs of images. So images taken from the same scene, but typically from different locations. So we have, I have one image of you sitting in the classroom taken from this location, and have a second image taken from here. And the question is, if we have those images, what can we say about the relative orientation of those cameras? So where is the second camera with respect to the first camera, for example? Or what can we infer about the scene? So if I have those two images, what can I tell about the 3D geometry of the scene? So again, not a single camera. We can use a camera, or this is a stereo ca camera consisting of two cameras which are rigidly connected. So actually I can't move them independently, I just can move them as a relative setup. This is a standard stereo camera, but you can also see that as taking two images with the same camera as long as the scene is static. And we are assuming static scenes here. So you, you don't need to have this stereo camera. You can have a camera, take an image, move the camera, take a second image. Of course, then the relative orientation between those two images is not always the same because it changes. Here, the relative orientation between those two cameras, of course, stays the same because they're originally connected. But we look typically in the general case where this doesn't have to be a physical single camera consisting of two cameras. Um, they, we take, can take different locations of a camera. And we are only looking into pairs of images for the moment. So for the first month, we, see we only have two images. Then we will generalize the approach later on towards multiple images. Okay, so what do we observe? So these are two aerial images taken from the, um, the same scene, but as you can see from slightly different locations. So here you can see the facade over here, which you're missing here due to the um, location of the camera. And what we are observing, if we have those corresponding points, are actually um, bundles of rays. So we have all those rays from the different objects to our image and those points over here correspond to distinct points in the scene and just one is sketched over here. And so the idea is given we know where those two camera images have been taken, we can actually say something about the 3D geometry of that scene. You can also see it the other way around. If we don't know from which location the camera has been taken, but we know a couple of those points, we can actually estimate where those um, camera images have been taken. So this is kind of the rough setup for today. And what, we, what I want to discuss with you today is, given we don't have 3D information about the scene, so we don't have control points, or passpunkt in German, what can we infer about the relative orientation of those two cameras? If I only know that, let's say I'm observing the same object, so this point over here corresponds to this point over here. There's the only knowledge that I have, but I don't know anything about the three location of those points. So what can I say about from which location the camera has been taken? So this kind of, we are starting with that today and f find a way on how to describe this relative orientation or describe that. In terms of kind of four blocks that this lecture is going to, to address today, the first thing is we just look into what is the relative orientation and how can we actually describe that? Then we look into some constraints, the so-called coplanarity constraints. So there's something which has to do with a plane if we have a corresponding point. And then we, this will guide us towards a matrix, which is called the fundamental matrix. And as the name says, it's very fundamental. And it is used to describe the relative orientation of two images. So I can actually express this in a matrix and then this matrix has certain properties which, can, which I can exploit, for example, for finding point correspondences. This is kind of testing or finding point, point correspondences is something which we will look into at the last block for today. So let's start with the first one, looking into the um, orientation parameters for the camera pair. So again, two images, either from one camera or from, uh, which has been moved, or from two cameras taking it's the same point in time. Um, and we want to look what are those orientations. Again, photogrammetry one was a single camera. Now we have two cameras. 
Okay, so we know how to describe the orientation of a single camera. We looked into the spatial resectioning algorithm or the DLT last term, which allowed us, given we know something about the scene, estimate where those camera, where the camera was when it was recording the scene. This required a certain number of control points. That means points in the 3D scene for which I know the 3D location. If I know the 3D location of a certain number of points, depending on the setup that I have, so do I have a calibrated camera or an uncalibrated camera, I can actually estimate where those cameras, where the camera was. So what we can now do as a kind of trivial approach, say, okay, we have two cameras, we observe the same scene. Assuming we know something about the scene, so we have these control points, we can actually estimate where those cameras are. Just do it independently for camera one and camera two, and then get those orientations. So how many parameters are needed for the calibrated camera in order to describe the orientation of the camera? Something we have done ex extensively in the last course. So if, if I have the calibrated camera, how many parameters are then needed for a single camera? So if my camera is calibrated, that means I know all the internal parameters of my camera. They're only the external or extrinsics which I need to compute. How many parameters are needed in order to describe the orientation of one calibrated camera then? Okay, so the camera can be located somewhere in space. You can have an X, Y, and that location where the camera can be in the direction where the camera is looking to. So this results in six parameters for a single camera. Three parameters for x, y, z, and three for the three rotational angles. So if I have two cameras, I do the thing for camera one and camera two, I'm ending up having 12 parameters over here for the first case. How does this change if we don't have any idea about the intrinsics? So we don't know the internal parameter of my camera. Assuming I only have linear errors, so we don't have nonlinear errors. How many parameters do I have then? So how many parameters did we use to describe the intrinsics? Strongly encourage you to look of the last month of the Photogrammetry 1 course, where all the projection matrices and all the things were explained. That's something we will extensively need through the course, through, let's say 90% of the course here. And also all the ideas of how, do, how cameras work. So the intrinsics were five parameters that we used. It was kind of the focal length, two parameters for the principal point. Um, then we had the shear and the change in scale between x and y. So we have five additional parameters for the, for the uncalibrated camera. So we have six for the intrinsics, uh, six for the extrinsics, five for the intrinsics per camera, gives us 11. For two cameras, we have 22 parameters over here. So 12 parameters for the calibrated case and 22 parameters for the uncalibrated case. Let's start with a calibrated camera. How can we obtain those 12 parameters? Parameters. How can we do that? Given the tool that you have at hand from the Photogrammetry 1 course. Assuming you have your control points. So what was the key algorithm which was discussed in the end of the Photogrammetry 1 course? For which approach we can use a DLT? A close. So what are the DLT estimates? Intrinsics and the extrinsics. So this is the solution for the uncalibrated camera case. So if we have the uncalibrated camera, we can use a DLT.
we assume we have our cameras calibrated, so we apply the calibration toolbox and have everything calibrated, um, which approach can we use then? Something which called spatial resectioning. Or räumliche Rückwärtsschnitt. So this was the approach that you can take over here. What you need to do is you need to have at least three corresponding points, uh, not corresponding points, three known control points. So points for which you know the 3D location in the world. Actually, you need four because otherwise you have some ambiguities. So if you have four known control points which are visible in both images, I can compute the location of the first camera and the location of the second camera independent of each other. But again, this requires us to have these control points. That means I need to know something about the scene in order to estimate where those cameras are. If you have the uncalibrated camera, as you said before, you can apply the DLT, just applying the DLT on camera image one and the DLT on camera image number two, which gives us 11 parameters for every image, and then we can estimate where um, the cameras have been and what their intrinsic parameters are. But this requires us to have six known control points. Because we have more parameters that we need to estimate, so we need to have more control points. This can be done if we know something about the scene. But this is the assumption that we want to drop now and say, okay, how can we actually solve this problem or which information can we actually obtain about the scene if we don't know anything about the scene? We can only know these correspondences. So a pixel in image number one corresponds to a certain pixel in image number two for a small or a certain number of points. We don't need to know that for every pixel. So we want to completely drop the assumption that we have additional knowledge about the scene. And the question is now, how can we estimate where our cameras are? OK, so this O with one prime. So everything which has one prime here is camera one. Everything which has two primes over here is camera number two. So this holds for all variable x uh, for the um, projection centers of the cameras. So in the, in the following notation, one prime cam so first prime camera number one, double prime camera number two. OK, if we know those corresponding points, that means we know that there's a ray going from here to this point from camera number one as well as from camera number two. We assume we know that they are corresponding. The question is, what, in which way does this help us to derive some, let's say, geometric constraints that need to hold? So what do we know about those two vectors? Anything we can infer? Yes, please. They cross in point X. That's one thing. What if we draw a connection between those two points as well, so between the projection centers of the camera? We know the angles. Yes, we know that. What else? So if we know the calibration parameters, but assuming you know them. So we have these three points. This is a triangle, and this is a triangle which lies in the 3D world. We have the three vectors. This forms a plane. So it's kind of, if this is the location of camera one, location of camera number two, and this is the intersecting point, this is a plane. If the points would not correspond, these vectors may look like this, and then they would not lie in a plane. But as soon as we know that these are corresponding points, this actually forms a plane. So consider we don't have any noise in measuring those corresponding points. We know that we have the perfect correspondences over here. Then we know that this triangle, or these vectors, all these vectors, 
fly within one plane. And that is something that we, this coplanarity constraint, that we want to exploit. Coplanarity because these three vectors lie in one single plane. If this is a corresponding point. If this is not a corresponding point, so if I made a mistake over here, it's still may possible that they lie in one plane, but often they do not. But if I know that this is a corresponding point, then I know that this forms a plane. And this is a constraint that we are going to exploit in the remainder of the course today. So is this clear to everyone why this is a plane? Why those three vectors form a plane? Okay. Okay, let's look into the case for the calibrated camera. So assume perfectly calibrated cameras. We said before, we have then 12 parameters for those cameras, basically the locations of the projection centers of the two cameras and the orientations of those two cameras. If this is a calibrated camera, that means we have an angle preserving mapping. But I don't know anything about the scene. So the only thing I can infer about the scene is that I know it up to, or also about the model that I have, up to a um, similarity transform, because this is the angle preserving transform. So that means we cannot estimate all 12 parameters. From knowing those correspondences, I cannot estimate all 12 parameters. So I want to know which parameters we cannot estimate. So assume we have two cameras, an image taken from here, an image taken from here. We only know corresponding points in the scene, but we don't have any idea about the 3D structure. I just, I just give you those two images. You can actually tell me something about the relative orientation of the cameras, but you, you can't describe everything. You can't describe all the 12 parameters. What are the parameters you cannot describe just from the images? Yes, please. Um, there are some rotations you can describe. There are some rotations you cannot describe. Can you be a bit more precise? The X and Y rotation. Um, which X and Y rotation? Um, if you're flying with a plane yeah. and taking an image from a plane, yeah. then the Z rotation would be the yaw, mm -hmm. and X and Y would be um, pitch and roll. Yeah. Mm, that's not really, unfortunately not really correct, but there are some rotations I cannot identify, this is correct. So you may get a good estimate by saying, okay, how can I actually move my camera or my scene and get exactly the same images? And then you identify parameters that you can't estimate. Exactly, so there's no absolute positioning. Just from two images without any additional information, I kind of have lost my external reference frame. So there's three rotations and a 3D position which I cannot estimate. Let's say you don't know where the first camera is in this scene. You can only say where's the second camera relative to the first camera. So six degrees of freedom are lost of these 12 degrees of freedom, for sure. Because we can actually basically move our scene, we'll get the same images. Unfortunately, there's one more parameter that, that is lost. And this is a part of how camera two is located with respect to camera number one. Any idea which information could be lost as well? So this is maybe a little bit hard to infer, therefore I have an image which tells you what, how this is. So what I also lose is the sense of scale. So consider I have an image or a certain number of corresponding points. This is camera number one and assume the world is just a cube like this cube over here. 
And I know where a second camera is with respect to the first camera in terms of the orientation and also in terms of the direction in which direction two is rated with respect to one. So then camera one could be sitting here and then this would be an explanation of what the world looks like. Or I just move this camera further away from camera number two and just scale up my world. If this is a house, this is just a bigger house. And those two scenes would generate exactly the same images if for scene number one the ca second camera would be located here or for scene number two the second camera would be located here. So I, l I still don't know anything about the scale. If I know how large the objects are in the scene, then I can estimate where this camera is. But if I don't have any additional information about the scene, then I lose the sense of scale. Well, the same thing for a single image. If we have one object pictured with a single camera, um, if we know the size of the object, we can estimate how far it is away, but um, we would generate exactly the same image if we have a small object in front of the camera or a large object being further away from the camera. So what we can't estimate is the rotation, or what we can estimate. So again, exactly what we can compute is the rotation of the second camera with respect to the first camera. So in which direction is this, cam is this camera looking with respect to this camera? So if this would be the reference frame, what the direction of this camera? This is something we can do. And we can estimate the direction. So this line over here. And know that the second camera lies on this line. But what we cannot estimate is the, the, the length of this vector. So we just know it's somewhere on this vector, but we don't know where it is on the vector. And this makes all sense because our cameras just measure directions. They don't give us a metric size. So we can only say, OK, we know the direction where this camera is looking to. We, know, we can estimate the direction of this vector, but we can't estimate the length. So as a result of that, we know we have 12 parameters, but seven parameters we cannot estimate. So we just end up having five parameters that we cannot estimate. And the, the, the parameters I cannot estimate is a translation of the rotation of the first camera so where is this in terms of an absolute reference frame? And the scale in terms of the size of the object, which is directly related to um, the distance between those two cameras. So if I talk about the relative orientation for the remainder of this course, I typically talk about this five parameters for the calibrated case. Because this is the only thing we can estimate if we don't have any additional information about the scene. If I have further information, I can do better. But assuming I only have those images, there's nothing I can do in order to get better than that. It's kind of the key take-home message here. If I don't have any further information about the scene, I will not be able to estimate the scale, and I won't be able to say where is, are those points located in an absolute sense or with respect to some, because there's an unknown global reference frame or coordinate system. Okay? And this is something which is called the uh, photogrammetric model. That means the, what we miss is the absolute orientation, and what we miss is the scale. So this five parameters allows me to, some, to compute something which is called the photogrammetric model. And if I want to kind of locate this photogrammetric model in the real world, this is something which is called absolute, computing the absolute orientation. And there's also something that we will do within this course, something very similar to that you should have done actually a year ago in Wolfgang Furstner's course on um, coordinate systems. So we actually come back to what he has done there. So for computing the absolute orientation, I need to have at least three points in the 3D world because I have seven unknowns which I need to estimate. So I need at least three points. Every point has three coordinates in order to do the absolute orientation. Okay?
So if we come back to this original image that I showed in the beginning, the, one of the questions that I have is now, what do we need to com uh, need in order to compute a 3D model of the world? So if you have, you can ask for additional knowledge. What can we do to say something about the 3D geometry of all those points here in the scene? So the first thing is that either we know the location of three points in the scene. Then I can do this absolute, compute the absolute orientation and get um, the full 3D model of the scene. What else could we ask for? Yeah. yeah, exactly. I'm asking for the position of the first camera. So if I fix the position of the first camera, I know more about the scene. Do I know everything about the scene? The I don't have the scale, exactly. How could I get the scale? Have the, size of one of the, the size of one of the objects? Or I just ask how far are the other cameras apart? That may be one of the reasons why you may use the stereo camera that I showed in the first slide, because it's rigidly mounted and you, you know its size. If you have that, then you know something about the geometry of the 3D scene. What I also could do is say, okay, I only want to know the baseline, so how far are those guys apart, those two cameras. Then I kind of lose the sense of where the scene is in terms of an absolute reference frame, but I actually can compute 3D locations um, in a relative way. So I know the can do exact measurements between those points in the 3D scene, but I don't know where they are located. In this case, I only need to know the baseline. So if I know the baseline, and this kind of the distance between the, um, the projection centers of my two cameras, I can estimate a 3D model, but I simply do not know then where this 3D model is in the world, but I know the kind of internal 3D structure of those points. Okay? So this was for the calibrated camera. Now let's have a look how this changes for the um, uncalibrated camera. So I want to look into what happens if you, use, if you use an uncalibrated camera. If I have an uncalibrated camera, I don't have an angle preserving mapping, I have a straight line preserving mapping. The straight line preserving mapping is something which I can uh, describe as a projective transformation. Something you have, should have heard before, you definitely heard it in the photogrammetry one course in the chapter on projective geometry. If I'm in the, in the 3D world, how many parameters do I need for this projective mapping? So the projective mapping is the most general transformation in the projective space. We're living in the 3D world. We extended it by one further dimension, so we have a 4 by 4 matrix. And I know it's a homogeneous transformation, it's a homogeneous object, this matrix. So I have this one scale parameter which is fixed. So how many degrees of freedom are left? 4 by 4 gives 16, minus 1 is 15. So this projective mapping has 15 parameters which are available. So the only thing I can do I have, I have this, this 22 unknown that I would like to have, and due to the mapping that those cameras generate, I have those 15 I'm left over with. So I have just seven parameters which um, I can compute to describe the relative orientation of two uncalibrated cameras. That means I don't get the full intrinsics out, because just two parameters more than for the calibrated case. So there's, an, um, there's ambiguities in the calibration parameter. By changing the scene and changing the calibration parameters, I may get exactly the same images. So for the uncalibrated camera, I have only seven degrees of freedom that I can estimate. So as a result of that, um, we need at least five points in the 3D world in order to nail down those 15 unknown parameters which I cannot estimate just from looking into images. So in contrast to the DLT where I needed six, six um, points, I only need five over here um, 
because the others I can actually estimate from the two, um, from, from just the images that I get from the two camera locations. So what I can describe is from the images of two uncalibrated cameras, seven parameters which describe me the relative orientation. This is an incomplete description because I would need 22. In order to fix the other 15, I would need five points in the 3D world because five times three gives me 15. Okay? So in terms of the computing the relative and the absolute orientation, so what I typically have, I have image coordinates in image number one and image coordinates in, Im in image number two. So what I then want to do is I want to compute the relative orientation. This is five degrees of freedom or seven degrees of freedom, depending if I'm a calibrated or uncalibrated case. And then I end up having this photogrammetric model, which has, which is not perfectly fixed because, for example, for the calibrated camera, I don't know where it is in space and I don't have an idea of scale. But the other parameters I can actually estimate. If I then have some additional control points, so this is the additional knowledge about the scene, I can compute the absolute orientation of this photogrammetric model, which gives me then the full 3D information about the scene. So to summarize this so far, so for the calibrated camera and the camera, uh, I have for a single camera six unknowns, x, y, z, and the three rotation angles, and for the uncalibrated case, I have 11, which is the six extrinsic plus the five intrinsics. So if I have the camera up here, it's just the same number multiplied by two. The parameters of the relative orientation that I can compute without additional scene knowledge is five and seven. So what remains are seven and 15 parameters. So the minimum number of points, control points that I need is three and five. It's basically the summary table of what we discussed so far. So what I was presenting here was the relative information that we can infer from two images. So what can we say about the cameras giving a pair of images? We can't describe everything. We can only describe a subset of those parameters. And these are five um, or seven, depending if I'm in the calibrated case or in the uncalibrated case. So the key take-home message. If we don't take into account additional scene knowledge, there are only five or seven parameters that I can estimate describing the maximum possible information about the relative information of those two cameras that I can describe. What we're going to continue now is trying to find those so trying to find a way to describe the relative orientation, which will in the end lead us to the fundamental matrix for the uncalibrated case, and then in weeks later to the essential matrix, which is the same or corresponding one for the calibrated, pay, calibrated case, and then see how can we estimate this fundamental matrix from certain parameters that we have, and how can we estimate that from corresponding points in the end. That's kind of the, the timeline what we are going to do in the second hour as well as in the next two or three weeks. We'll make a five-minute break now and then continue here with the next block. <laughs>